All right, I'm Professor Harold Geller of George Mason University. I'm also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. I've been uh, doing the uh, outreach for NASA JPL since January of this year and certainly enjoy uh, talking to, uh, to be honest, one of my favorite was talking to a group of fifth graders uh, that NASA sent me to speak to and I got to read to them about Mars and it was interesting to see their interest and I think the nation showed some interest with this latest mission. Now I have a history with Mars myself and so I won't just be talking about the Mars Curiosity rover. I'm going to give a little rundown of the previous uh, spacecraft that successfully landed on Mars and uh, some that didn't and some that just orbited. Uh, I have a history with the Viking mission that allowed me to get my master's degree and then I'll also talk about uh, a meteorite specifically from Mars and then some of the latest missions before I get to the latest of all Curiosity or the Mars Science Lab. And then I'll have a rundown if you fall asleep of the conclusions, real simple. This is out from a uh, textbook that I use in astronomy. I guess it's one that isn't just giving you a rundown. I'm not going to go over it. There's a lot of information that we know about Mars and we have for years. The distance from the sun, the eccentricity of orbit, it is the, uh, <clears throat> one of the more eccentric, as we say, that is more elliptical in orbit of the planets. Uh, the Earth's orbit and many of the others are very nearly circular. The higher the value of eccentricity, the more elliptical shape that it is. Also, uh, how long it takes to go around. Everyone's heard about uh, just under two Earth years. It's 667 days. Uh, one of the cool things is rotation on its axis is just 37 minutes different from our own Earth. And the uh, inclination of the equator to the orbit, uh, you know, the Earth's 23 and a half and Mars is 25.19 degrees. Uh, you can also see, uh, I do have a, uh, sorry that it's not larger, but this is the actual comparison of a marble-sized Earth to a marble-sized Mars relative to one another. So as you see here, uh, as far as the diameter, it's a little more than half the diameter of the Earth. And again, these are supposed to be true to size, Earth and Mars. <clears throat> so there's a lot of information about Mars, but uh, it's nice to actually go there and see what it looks like and we'll show you uh, the missions. I also like to uh, link again historically. Uh, I have an old uh, book in astronomy, uh, a popular astronomy book from 1902. Uh, actually Richard Proctor unfortunately didn't live to see the American edition. He was a British astronomer and this was so popular in Great Britain that they published it in the United States. Unfortunately he died before it got published in the United States. But as you can see here, and this is again from 1902, the planet Mars exhibits in the clearest manner the traces of adaptation to the wants of living beings such as we are acquainted with. Processes are at work out yonder in space which appear utterly useless, a real waste of nature's energies unless, like the correlatives on Earth, they subserve the wants of organized beings. So, in that time frame, and I'm going to go over real quickly why this was the case, most people in that day and age actually thought Mars had life, intelligent life, and we'll go over some of the reasons why, even though, yes, that wasn't true, but it's interesting to me from the historical perspective that we've gone through um, sort of like a cycle where we believed that it had life, and then, well, then we didn't, and then, well, maybe it does. It's just interesting to go through this. A lot of the belief that intelligent life existed on Mars comes from a misreporting, as you see here, a misreporting of a report written by an Italian astronomer 
Now, he used the term, which was completely legitimate, in 1876, he said he discovered canali. Well, canali in Italian actually is just a channel. He never said that it was artificially made or anything. The largest, he probably never even saw it. The largest one, of course, is Valles Marineris, which you know, doesn't look like an artificial canal at all. But the reporting just turned that right into canal, which of course implies that intelligent human beings or some intelligent Martians actually did that. Uh, Schiaparelli, uh, actually, this was done in um, somewhat his, uh, well, he was only 41 when he announced that, but he had failing health, even though he managed to live to uh, 1910, and he uh, stopped observing um, when he was just, yeah, this was 41, in his 40s because of his uh, health. But Percival Lowell, who uh, was a PhD astronomer out of uh, MIT, in 1902, uh, 1902 he got the MIT position as astronomer, but he was a uh, well-to-do, did you know if this got out to the 10th? Yes. Oh, it did? Oh, yeah, okay. Everyone there just talk them down and... Okay, great. But there were some others. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. So he, he was convinced that he saw something, but it's more than likely, oops, I went too fast on that. It's more than likely, this is, uh, you know, NASA History Division and uh, Steve Dick uh, provided this. Look at all these, uh, well, what he thought was canals and everything. And the more recent theory is that he had uh, complex um, eyepieces, as uh, many of you do actually, but if you look at it in the right way, you actually can see a reflection of your retina. And today our best guess is that this map is really the uh, capillaries in Percival Lowell's eyes, <laughs> not anything that's really on the surface of Mars, of course. And it, it just again points out, um, yes sir? Not exactly the same. No two maps were ever the same. And so you've got to realize that what they're seeing may be part of their own optics, whether something in the eyepiece or objective and things like that. So it, it was very difficult to match any two. Uh, the one that actually, uh, again, you can't really even see. Valles Marineris really was discovered by the Mariner spacecraft. And I'll get to that. And you don't even see that, and that's the largest one that you might be able to see. Mm -mm. All right, so uh, just to show you the positive view of uh, intelligent life forms on Mars at the turn of you know, the previous century in the early 1900s, uh, there was an award put forward by a French science organization for anyone to find, anyone who finds a uh, proof of life on another planet except Mars. It was a given. <laughs> it wasn't allowed any proof about life on Mars. So it was rather interesting. That was a uh, French science organization. And here you see I point out, no two drawings agreed on the formation on the planet's uh, varied surface. and. Uh, Again, don't forget, this is just the beginning of uh, photography, uh, availability. <clears throat> the views weren't that excellent. But now we go there, and I'll run through these uh, quickly. Mariners 4, 6, and 7, and the reason one's missing is they don't all succeed. Uh, these are all flybys in uh, 69, Mariner 6, uh, and in March, Mariner 7, you'll also note that in the earlier days of NASA, there was always two of everything. It just had to do with uh, reliability and the probability of failure of two versus one. They didn't have, as you might say, as much confidence, even though many times, like here both uh, 6 and 7 worked fine, and Viking Lander 1 and Viking Lander 2 also worked fine, although actually there were differences. <clears throat> 
but really at closest approach, 3,400 kilometers. This wasn't anything to actually getting there. And don't forget the technology. In 1969, you're really using cameras that were developed, oh, five to seven years earlier. And these are the photographs from uh, Mariner 4. Very fuzzy, not great resolution. But this was a time, and I remember this well, where we went the opposite extreme saying, oh my goodness, look at this. You just see, it just looks like craters. There's nothing outstanding. And here, there's some shades of, of you know, gray here and the like. But gee, it just looks, uh, well, at least these pictures weren't all too different from the moon. It was really a disappointment, uh, which I actually still remember well. <clears throat> uh, there were a number of different instruments, and I'm going to talk something that is a uh, little understood by some of the media reporters about the Mars Science Lab and Curiosity and what it's really meant to do. It has to do with the science instruments on the spacecraft, on the rover, and I'll talk about that. And here you see, you know, relatively modest suite uh, narrow and wide angle cameras at low resolution, a radiometer for infrared only, infrared spectrometer, ultraviolet spectrometer. You need a lot more information, temperature, pressure, atmospheric. And again, still a bit of a disappointment as far as what's there. Um, the former Soviet Union also attempted, and they had failures, and in honesty, so did uh, the Americans have failures. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's nothing really new. Mariner 9 was a big leap. Uh, unfortunately, it got there when there was a global dust storm. So I still remember in the beginning it was extremely uh, disappointing. But then when things cleared, right over here is the top of Olympus Mons. <clears throat> and you see a crater within a crater. This is actually a volcanic caldera. You know, that's the top of a volcano, and it's the largest volcano in the solar system. And over here we see uh, where, gee, you do have, you know, they're not straight, and they don't look exactly artificially, you know, made some, by some intelligent, but you actually do begin to see, and I'll talk more about the channels, um, and as Schiaparelli called them, canale, but again, that means channel. <clears throat> it's not a direct correlative to uh, canals in English. But Harold, on, on the scale of that picture, Schiaparelli wouldn't have seen those. Right. That's right, he couldn't it's see this. Coincidental. Yes. But what I'm saying is, you know, we went from, uh, gee, there definitely is something there, and you have those canals and the like, and then, you know, with the Mariners 4, 6, and 7, it looks really you know, lower resolution, you don't see any of this. And at least back when 9, ah, there is something there that we can look at. So that, that's the view I'm taking. There's no way Schiaparelli or Percival Lowell could ever have seen these. But now it's getting a little more interesting, at least, with Mariner 9. And just to show that, gee, even back in the late 60s, early 70s, there were also financial problems that Congress and the administration went through. Notice that uh, Viking was originally scheduled to launch in 1973. I'll go through when it actually did <clears throat> launch. And then it was Congress who came up with the great idea, well, let's have this land on Independence Day 1976, the 200th anniversary. <clears throat> there was also uh, a number of people don't know this little uh, tidbit from history. The um, Viking, the original Viking one spacecraft and lander had a problem and so they swapped they just brought the other unit out and viking two orbiter and lander actually was renamed viking one because it was the first one to go and uh there's uh, a little uh historical point from this because you can actually see that um for whatever reason i you know i don't think anyone has uh been able to determine why that's the case. The, the original Viking Lander 1 uh, had other problems. And what was going to be Viking 2 actually ended up being the better bet, as it were. So launched Viking Lander 1, 
re now renamed Viking One. August 20th, 1975, Viking Lander Two, September 9th, 1975. The orbiters had separate instrumentation, just as the Mars Science Lab had a lot more than just what's on Curiosity. Television system, atmospheric water detector, the landers, and here's what the suite is. <clears throat> Uh, gas chromatograph, mass spec, this is the data that I uh, was part of a reanalysis. Not the original team, Klaus Beeman was uh, from MIT. He had invented and designed uh, the smallest at, in that day gas chromatograph mass spec. Um, by the way, mass spectrometer means you can tell the difference in the chemical composition by the weight of the chemicals in there, and that's what you're dealing with. X-ray fluorescent spectrometer, I'll talk a little about that. A seismometer, that's important. How do you determine the uh, interior of a planet, even with the Earth? You do it with seismometers. How do we know about the interior structure of the Earth? So having two seismometers on the surface of Mars allowed us to learn more about the interior of the planet. A weather station and the uh, well-known sampler arm. <clears throat> the aero shells, the protective shells, and you'll see how that looks with the Curiosity. Also, it was part of this uh, instrumentation suite. June 19, 1976, it arrived at Mars, which was in time to have a July 4th landing. But the original landing site turned out not to be a very good place to land. Viking lander was not a rover. It just stay put. Um, unless they've moved it, has anyone been to the... National Air and Space Museum in D.C. recently. It used to sit in the main lobby, the engineering model. I don't know if it's still there. I haven't been there recently. You can go and see it, the size of the like. It's a couple of hundred pounds less than the Curiosity rover, but really of the same uh, size. <clears throat> and so it took NASA a little longer to figure out what would be a safe landing place. And personally, I like the day better. I, Remember well, I was with my uh, brother at a cousin's house watching the lunar lander landing in 1969, and this actually was seven years later to the day that Viking Lander 1 descended. It immediately took a picture of its landing pod, the foot, because there were some scientists who were concerned that it might sink into the soil. The uh, cameras themselves were not standard cameras. This was the earliest in the design of CCDs in a way, and they actually had a rotating turret and mirror which would go across and accumulate the image. So it just had a single um, line array, uh, and it would have to move and put in the new uh, portion of that. And so Carl Sagan is infamous for an image taken in the Mojave Desert where they were testing the engineering model that's in the Air and Space Museum, <clears throat> if it's still there. And he uh, stood in the back so that he knew the scan rate and his head appears four different times in that one image. <laughs> and he was just, uh, you know, pulling their leg in a sense, but also he wanted uh, to point out, gee, if you, we really had these, um, and of course it didn't work out that way, but if you really had these large creatures who were moving fast enough, you could actually miss them with this design. It, you know, didn't turn out to be anything worth uh, worrying about. Here are some of the first pictures from the orbiter, and where you actually do see some uh, <coughs> channels, and I'll talk more about that. And then, of course, I want to throw in the infamous face on Mars, which, of course, turned out to be nothing artificial, but, you know, there's a, uh, and I'm not going to mention names, anthropologist who made millions of dollars selling books saying that this face was made by, you know, intelligent Martians. Um, Come back and look at it, that same feature, with a higher resolution camera at different solar angles, you know, the angle of the sun and shadow, 
And, uh, you know, gee, where's that face now? This is the 1998 uh, Mars Global Surveyor image. You can kind of see where the, the face, uh, the mouth, excuse me, the mouth was. But you also see it's a different solar angle and light up. And this was really in shadow and not symmetric. And again, low resolution. But it just goes to show you can make lots of money even if what you write is total nonsense. <clears throat> this is the first composite color photo. Uh, I'd like to point out that right here you actually see, and uh, uh, we'll point to something similar with the Curiosity rover. You know, how do you know you have true color? Well, of course, the American flag should look like an American flag, but there's actually a color chart there almost like an eye chart, but just for color, to determine we know what the true colors are, match the colors. <clears throat> so, and this was really something, 19, uh, July 22nd, 1976, we're on the surface already, the sample arm was supposed to go out, and it actually got stuck. Now, it may not seem like much as far as reprogramming the arm to do something different. What they thought, which was correct, is that it's called a cotter pin was stuck. And if you tap on the door that was protecting the thing, if, well, sort of knock hard, really, you might knock out the cotter pin that didn't, the explosive bolt didn't completely finish. They had to reprogram the onboard computer. Now I know we all have, you know, I, I, I can't remember what I have, um, but I know I've got 512 megabytes of RAM in my laptop. We only had 64 kilobytes of RAM on the Viking lander. So um, the technology was very different, and yet we did amazing things, and I like to point that out. Finally deployed July 28th. The first uh, analysis done was with the X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, and you'll see there's one on Curiosity as well. And that's for inorganic compounds in the soil. <clears throat> 15 to 30 percent, the range is because different, there were three different uh, primary samples taken, and the analysis showed variation. 12 to 16 percent iron, calcium, aluminum. Everybody talks about, you know, a relatively high iron, giving you the high in oxide, uh, uh, ruddy, rusty color. <clears throat> the GCMS, this was the one that said, well, gee, we don't see, and again, Klaus Beeman of MIT was one of the uh, inventors of the compact uh, GCMS, and it actually worked on the very first uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometers. So what did it tell us? Carbon dioxide, some water. You know, every time we seem to rediscover water, but we knew about this in 1976. The primary purpose, though, is what organic compounds do you have? <clears throat> and we didn't find any. And there was a uh, lot of questions about this, uh, particularly since the biology experiments actually gave a bit of a positive result. I'll talk a little about that. <clears throat> and I would like to point out, there is no biology lab on the Curiosity rover. So I want to make that clear, despite what some of these uh, reporters in the media have said, is no biology lab. I'll try to explain to you what experiments are done that should help us point to whether or not there might be life in the Gale Crater. This is a very different uh, location, and I'll point to that too with the globe. These are the three biology experiments, or paralytic release, labeled release, I really got to get through these, <clears throat> so I can get to curiosity. But, you know, these people worked hard. They uh, did the analysis. Again, initially, there seemed to be some reactions going on. But I also worked with uh, people from the University of Maryland at College Park, had a laboratory for chemical evolution. It was led by Cyril Pontiac Ruma. And they were one of those teams that was selected to work on how else these results could take place, especially since there's no organic material. How can you have life as we know it, which is what all of these biology experiments were looking for, 
if you don't have organic compounds. So, um, and again, there are people associated with this. They came to their conclusions. There was a team that um, had to come underneath um, Harold Klein. Uh, everyone called him Skip Klein. <clears throat> you know, and almost all of these have passed on now, the PIs from those days. Uh, Gil Levin is actually still alive. <clears throat> and he is the contrarian of uh, them all. He was really upset when uh, Skip, uh, you know, published the paper It came to the conclusion there really was no organic material, no reason for the positive results in the biology experiments, except for inorganic chemistry that mimicked what the biologists were trying to look for. <clears throat> And this is just what I'm saying here, that we have biology experiments initially uh, show some reactivity. They're redone. There's a change in the reactivity. What's going on? And again, but there's no organic material. <clears throat> and again, uh, Gil Levin, who's in his 80s, is the only science team member who really still maintains. Now, he has a couple of grad students that he's worked with, and they... Uh, try to support his view, but it's a minority view. There's always uh, minority views in science. The uh, meteorological instruments on the Viking lander were outstanding. And I just want to point out, these are human beings. Seymour Hess was in charge of this. He had a sense of humor. So remember this, when they uh, announced the, the results, he just came to the microphone and said these words exactly. Light winds from the east in the late afternoon, changing the light winds from the southwest after midnight. Maximum winds of 15 miles per hour. Temperature range from minus 122 Fahrenheit just after dawn to minus 22 Fahrenheit. Freshness remained steady at 7.7 .7 millibars. Closed his book and then walked away and that was it. <laughs> so, you know, hey, there are humans with a sense of humor as well. And again, he just tried to make it, hey, this is just the weather on Mars. Also point out, and we also hope to do this with curiosity, that Viking, and as you see, Viking Lander 1, <clears throat> which was originally the two, which became one, lasted six years, over six years. And I'm sure thankful for that. <clears throat> Viking Lander 2 through uh, 1980. Not quite as long. <clears throat> so because of longevity, we can get more than just a single orbit of Mars around the sun. Remember, it takes almost two years there. And so you can actually begin to look at climate. Now, there's slight differences in where they landed, and I'll show you an image of that as well. But you can get an idea and begin to build models and show pressure variation that also helps explain um, the changing in the polar ice caps in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. It's mostly carbon dioxide. There is some water in there, but mostly frozen carbon dioxide, which is, you probably know, sublimes, goes directly from solid to gas. And when it freezes, it goes from gas to solid. <clears throat> there are changes in the circulation. And because you had two Viking craft there, you can also get different latitudes and longitudes. Again, uh, largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. Uh, Valles Marineris was discovered by uh, Mariner 6 and 7 and named Valley of the Mariners because they uh, discovered it, really. Uh, higher resolution images from the Viking orbiters. And now we get to what's going on as far as what's happened since then, and where we've been. And you can see here, uh, this is where Curiosity in Gale Crater is. Here's Viking Lander 1, Viking Lander 2. We also had Pathfinder, 1996. <coughs> Phoenix was 2008 to 9. Opportunity, 2003, with Spirit. So, you know, we've tried different areas. <coughs> 
to get more of an idea of conditions across the planet. This is a great view from the Pathfinder, where Sojourner came off from. Sorry to block your view. There's Sojourner, taken from the main lander. And yes, those had the airbags as it was landing, going up. That was the smallest. But that was a proof of concept, really. <clears throat> That's why it was called Pathfinder. And that led to the, oh, here's Sojourner again, and the images taken by the very small, <clears throat> just 10 kilos, and just lasted three months looking at the rocks in the vicinity where she landed. Mars Global Surveyor, orbiting since 1996, has been the uh, bulk of the highest resolution images of Mars, of the surface of Mars. <clears throat> Some great views here. This is part of a, uh, it's one region of Valles Marineris. <clears throat> and it just shows, gee, looks like something was at one point, not now, but millions and maybe even more than that, years ago, flowing down those sides. We also had a mission called Odyssey in 2001. And here is the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. And this is a nice shot from Opportunity looking back <coughs> to uh, the platform that it came off of and the airbags. And this is just looking back on uh, Spirit's trip. And don't forget, you know, one of them still works now. Uh, the Phoenix mission, which again, look for the water. Gamma ray spectrometer also uh, giving you the ability uh, to, um, by the way, one of the problems with the surface of Mars, it doesn't have protection of a global magnetic field. <clears throat> you get high energy charged particles and uh, you don't have protection like ozone, which actually blocks UV, but other protections of a thick atmosphere to stop gamma rays from reaching the surface. Phoenix was an excellent mission. Um, by the way, you know, note, I note here, this is the engineering mock-up. There was nothing there to take a picture of Phoenix when it landed in 2008. Launched again, August 2007. And you may note something here. Gee, 10 month journey, 422 million miles. And yet we say that Curiosity was 320 some odd million miles. And by the way, that's not the distance from the Earth to Mars, as some reporters have said. But it has a you know, Mars transfer orbit, so it has to follow that. So as you see, Phoenix was a little longer in its orbit. <clears throat> it takes like a, almost a portion of a circle that you've shifted out. And um, it really is sad and funny at the same time, some of the things that I've heard uh, reporters say. They just don't get it. <clears throat> now, I'll, I'll be going over the uh, descent of curiosity, but I did also want to point out, we have had powered descent <clears throat> with a uh, parachute, both Phoenix and the Vikings, going back to 1976. The, only, the, the one thing that was added was this crane feature, which I'll show you. So we have had, and you know, uh, a number of people made a big deal. Gee, you had radar to uh, help it land, and um, you know, we saw Phil with that floating device make it. You know, we we do do that, and we have done that. Um, Phil was the intelligence behind getting the shot from the little air device, but a computer can also use radar to determine the distance and velocity, and then what's needed to land safely. And that, again, was done on Phoenix. The only thing missing on the Phoenix mission was that sky crane. The science instruments on Phoenix, <clears throat> you know, weather instrumentation, microscopy to look up. It was like a geologist taking close-up images of the rocks. It also had a robotic arm much more complex 
than the Viking robotic arm. This was many years later, of course. And it had an imager that was, you know, two cameras for stereo imaging and uh, thermal gas analyzer. <clears throat> Arrived in May 2008, remember, left in uh, August 2007. And here you see some of the uh, images. Here's the scooper, some of the solar array, and uh, the Mars field. And this was a very famous one of, gee, something is beneath there that then disappeared, sublimated, uh, because of the pressure on Mars being so low. You're not going to go from uh, solid to liquid. Again, the view of the interior of Mars, largely helped by the Viking landers, is to tell the interior of a planet you want to have seismometers. <clears throat> and that, that was our first shot at it. Just to give you an idea of the difference in the uh, largest volcano, Olympus Mons, 27 kilometers high, 72 kilometers wide at the uh, baseline. Mount Everest, everyone knows as the uh, largest mountain, is just nine kilometers above sea level. Mauna Kea actually is larger than that, 10 kilometers above the ocean floor. <clears throat> Nonetheless, as you note, this is uh, Olympus Mons dwarfs that, being 27 kilometers high. Again, uh, Mariner 9 in particular is when they named it and the very well defined. And again, this is not something that would have been visible with the resolution of the telescopes of Schiaparelli or uh, Percival Lowell. <clears throat> There are different uh, craters with different ejecta patterns. And of course, there's going to be differences from lunar ejecta patterns because of the gravitational. Oh, I guess what I didn't show, which I should have also shown is, you know, I have, I have a set. I'm sorry, it's so small. You know, this is the Earth marble, and these are two sides. That's Mars, and that's the moon. So the moon's considerably smaller with a lot less gravity. So, you know, Mars is a lot more interesting from the viewpoint of um, <clears throat> the geology and volcanoes. And even dunes on Mars. And channels, yes, there really are channels. But again, uh, all these images, by the way, are from the Viking lander. They were not seen even with the Marinus. Okay, there's little doubt that water flowed on the surface of Mars. Uh, runoff ch channels are the ones you may be more familiar with, say coming down from a higher elevation. <clears throat> Outflow is more of a flood-like, and there is some evidence of that as well. <clears throat> Real quickly, uh, talk about meteorites. Those of you who remember 1996, big announcement, ooh, is this, particularly this thing right here, is this evidence of a microbe that once lived on Mars? By the way, today we say, nah. <clears throat> but it was a big deal. How many years ago is this? Uh, just 16, is it that long? Holy mackerel, I'm getting old. <laughs> Golden made a big deal of this, but there actually was another announcement, but they didn't make a big deal of it. In fact, backed off completely in 2011 when another NASA scientist announced that he too thought this. <clears throat> if you look, I get into this with my class. This is from the conclusion from the actual published paper. And notice this, although there are alternative explanations for each of the results that we come with, um, taken individually, when they are considered collectively, in their view, it's evidence for primitive life on early Mars. But you know what? That was their view. 
unfortunately not the view of the community. And these were papers, uh, Scott et al., two papers later coming to different conclusions. Now, to our current uh, efforts on the surface of Mars, the Mars Science Lab. Again, one of the things I want to point out, you'll note there is no biology experiments here. You have cameras, you have a lot more, and they're going to give some really great pictures. There's the mass camera, uh, Mars Descent Imager that already sent some of those, and the lens imager for the close-ups going to the rocks. Spectrometers, remember, spectrometers for whatever basis they use, whether X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, they're looking at chemical composition. You know, one thing I teach in my astronomy classes, one of the main ways we know about the composition of the stars and material between us and those stars is what's called spectroscopy. Well, spectrometry and other types of spectroscopy, again, are for determining chemical composition. With spectroscopy, it has to do with emission lines in the visible or other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. <clears throat> with some of the, you know, the mass spec that I worked on for data, that had to do with the actual mass of the molecules. Uh, radiation detectors, one of the, again, a big problem is there's even neutron bombardment of the soil. That's not good for life if you haven't figured it out. Nor gamma rays, nor x-rays. And there's no ozone layer to stop the ultraviolet radiation. Those all cause mutations in the genes. The environmental monitoring station, that's like a weather station that we had on uh, Viking and others. <clears throat> so, here's some of the, uh, this is a true picture. This was the launch. <clears throat> November 26, 2011, on an Atlas V541 out of Cape Canaveral. Trip took eight months. It did travel 354 million miles. And say, you know, it's not that Mars is any more distant than it was back at the, uh, one of the other, oh, the Phoenix, which took long. It's the Mars transfer orbit going across why it takes long. Um, we say, you know, I try to explain to my students, the Earth is the definition of one AU, 93 million miles, <clears throat> 150 million kilometers. Mars is about 50% further away. It is 1.5 AU, just measured from the center of our solar system at the sun. But, you know, sometimes it's on, you guys all know this, on the opposite side, sometimes it's the same side. So, this is a true uh, picture, really did happen. <clears throat> this is a caricature of how the Curiosity is tucked, or was tucked into the Aero shell, which is called back shell and heat shield, is the descent stage and the actual rover. <clears throat> and this is the target, which it got to very clearly. This is Gale Crater. And again, Gale Crater is set a little differently. Well, you can come up and look at the globe. It's going to be real hard to see, but you can see it on the globe a little uh, better on a globe, in my opinion, even though I showed you on that two-dimensional map. There's a central mound, what they call Mount Sharp. We're right about there. And I'll also show you uh, Friday uh, pictures released and also where they're going. As far as those 2003 Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, they were considerably smaller. We had 384 pounds. Curiosity is just about a ton. <clears throat> I know uh, it's kind of funny. I've heard uh, different comparisons. Uh, a British astronomer said, it's like a mini Cooper you know, that, on that side. And a, a German said, uh, like an old beetle. You know, <laughs> everyone has to use their own. So you can choose what you'd like to refer to it. But that's it. You'll note the instrument, the actual instrumentation <clears throat> is much less than, of course, the total weight. 11 pounds of instruments on the Mars Ex Exploration Rover's Spirit and Opportunity over 165 pounds for curiosity. And uh, sometimes, I, so what's all the other weight? Well, both of these are rovers. They have to know how to control all of the 
wheels and also when they have you know, to stop and the like, that takes up weight. It's not just computer um, software, which doesn't weigh anything, but it's the computer hardware, which does weigh something on all of these. Is that earth weight or Mars weight? That's earth weight. This is the uh, descent that everyone, you know, made this big deal of, what was it, the seven minutes of uh, what? <clears throat> Try not to say that, but okay. And, and you can see, and as I said, a lot of this is very similar to Phoenix and Viking. Uh, the one thing that was different, it, you know, both Phoenix and Viking also had power descent, was this uh, cable mechanism set up, which called Sky Crane. And then the uh, upper portion, you know, shot off the uh, thrusters to get well away from it. And um, just so there's no one coming up with a TV show to say this wasn't really done, you know, the Europeans had a spacecraft there. We have the Mars Global Surveyor. And we do have pictures of this. But you know what? This isn't it. <laughs> this is still the artist's depiction that was released even before, showing, you know, when it starts entering the atmosphere, what's taking place, the heat shield heating up, the parachute opening, and that parachute is slowing it from 900 miles an hour to 180 miles an hour. <clears throat> and then you get rid of the heat shield as it's slowed down. And note, the rover's descent camera begins taking a movie. And we, we have that. And again, this is still the art, artist rendering. But there are things we have. This was the most unusual thing about it. The fact that, remember, it's not just supposed to land, it's roving. So it is dropping the rover as you have these rockets, keeping it slow descent, and then final firing so they get away after they've cut the, um, the nylon, by the way. <clears throat> so what NASA like to point out, seven minutes from traveling at 13,000 miles an hour to sitting still on the surface. And again, the unique situation here of it's immediately ready to go. Sky crane takes off and then you have, <clears throat> so you have a rover. Remember all the uh, other rovers, the um, Sojourner, Spirit Opportunity, they came down with airbags. Ooh, a new pointer here, a fly. <clears throat> Curiosity was ready to go once the uh, sky crane, in a sense, leaves. And again, this is still the artist rendering. I hope you realize, gee, there's nothing there to take this picture. So how could it be that? And yet, I'm telling you, I had some of these people, oh, is that how it looks really now? No. But these are real images. And because they have the <clears throat> European Space Agency, Mars Express, able to take, look, there it is. It really is taking place. So hopefully we won't have this thing of, gee, it never happened or anything. And then when you know, it had a camera on there, it can take this. And by the way, this was showing it was a bit more of a uh, concern, you know, we're coming up to, this is showing the previous solar max and coming out of solar min and then going back into, we're, we're on the uptick, there's more solar activity. Everything worked out fine. And these are the first pictures taken by Curiosity and, you know, look out there, you know, and some ways, well, it doesn't look like here because there's no green, but if you've been out in the desert southwest, <clears throat> in particular, uh, when I visited years ago and with my brother, the painted desert in Arizona, you get some of the same coloration. <clears throat> and this is a, sort of a bird's eye view. Well, it was able to take the uh, upper camera and the mass cam and look straight down at itself. And uh, just released on Friday, just a couple of days ago, 
was this image and the fact that they've decided that this rock called N165 is going to be its first uh, target. And what do you mean target? Well, it's going to go over there. It's going to use a laser. And it's not going to destroy it. They, I've seen this ridiculous stuff. You know, it's only going to make a small, you know, in a sense, crater on there. But it's going to vaporize the very top layer of that rock so that it can get a, you know, spectroscopy, chemical composition of it. <clears throat> uh, they also released this, and this is the one image I do want to talk about a bit. Uh, you know, they say, well, gee, this is an image taken by Curiosity. You know what, people? I don't know if you realize. First of all, look at the sky. Does that look like the others, like I showed you from Viking? No. This is a false colorized image. Now, uh, the Public Affairs Office officially says that this image was done so that the geologists looking at it could get an idea of how it might look in sunlight that they're used to seeing. But the bottom line is, uh, the sky doesn't look like that. You saw in the Viking images, it's always a reddish hue. There's no you know, blue atmosphere. It doesn't have nitrogen. It's 97% carbon dioxide, by the way. There's no nitrogen oxygen atmosphere there. <clears throat> they also brought out some of the differences here. They're, you know, what does this look like? Even though it isn't, what? Yeah. Well, it isn't. As I said, this is false color image. So please look at the, uh, and by the way, NASA did release a caption on Friday associated with this. But you know what? Many reporters just ignore that caption. Sorry. That's the media and uh, <clears throat> NASA probably doesn't want me to say this, but you know, that's true. But here's a great view of some of the scars left by the landing. Of course, remember, it was active. You had rockets firing down, changing the surface. So it's not a pure surface, yeah. Do they have RGB for that, what they called false color? So it's just rebalanced? Yes, that's correct. No, they do, yeah. It was, was yes, it is RGB. But it was, uh, as I said, they said it was colored to give the geologists an idea of how it might look if it were here on Earth. Photoshop. <laughs> Photoshop, yeah. But um, in fact, you can even see the soil doesn't look the same. This is a true RGB image, OK? Does that look the same as this? No. <clears throat> and again, these are, um, before they go and shoot the laser at that little rock N165 or whatever number it was, they actually have um, ways to calibrate the instrument. On the Curiosity rover is what's called ChemCam Calibration Target Assembly. Um, I don't know, did I include the close-up? I'm sorry, I may not have included the, no, I didn't. I didn't include the close-up, it doesn't matter. But what this is are targets for the laser, and they know the chemical composition of those targets. And so they shoot the targets and calibrate the instrument. Is it getting, they know what it's made of in the lab. So these are all, you know, known samples, and they're going to use that laser first on that. Then they'll hit the rock with that. And this is just a nice view of the uh, rover itself, taken by mask and looking back down on it. So why are so many of the first images out of this laser black and white compared to all the ones that we show from, say, Odyssey? And opportunity? Just has to do with processing time how long it takes to get the data across. And, you know, it's like my students, you know, we, we have a $10,000 CCD now for our new telescope at George Mason University Observatory. And I immediately had questions. Well, it doesn't take color images? No, it's a straight CCD in order to take color images. We have to next buy a color filter, or not a color, but a filter wheel and get RGB filters, take red, green, blue, and then 
make a composite color image. Okay, so a lot of it. Why is it um, black and white to start? That's the first straight data coming across. It's just going to be, you know, black, it's white, it's gray. Time. Yeah, it, it requires more time, just like it will for us with a filter wheel and uh, RGB filters to get a color image. How often do they have to calibrate the sensors? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm uh, aware of them doing the calibration and then shooting. There's still more sample there. They can recalibrate and make sure it's working properly. Um, I knew that about Viking. We had three calibration runs. I don't know what they have exactly. This is where it landed, and Friday it was noted that they are going to first go to a place called Glen Elk. <clears throat> this is what was chosen. As you see, it's on the rim of an, an inner impact, in a sense. <clears throat> and actually, it'll be about a month before it gets out there. They're first going to go to that rock to test the laser, and then they're slowly going to go across and get to Glen L. Their ultimate goal, of course, is down here, and this gives you an idea. There's the uh, landing site. Again, this was just released Friday, <clears throat> so I don't have much uh, data on this. There's the landing site, then there's Glen L. And then it's going to go to the base of that central mountain, which is now called Mount Sharp. And they're going to try to get it through what's called the lower reaches, the base of the mountain that they found this channel. You know, some may say, why don't you just go here? It's, it's hard to tell. This is a two-dimensional image. You know, it would fall down, okay? So, yeah, it's a cliff. Fall off the cliff. <clears throat> so the idea is find the place. And this is why this was chosen. A, something has carved its way through there and gives us a way of getting the lander through and further out towards the uh, mountain, which is really Central Peak. This was a impact crater, yeah? What's the speed of the road? I have forgotten, I'm sorry. It's not very fast. You said months. <laughs> yes, that's right, 30 days to get to uh, Glen Elk. The re you know, it has to go slowly because it is, um, I hate to use the term artificial intelligence, there's computer intelligence on there, and it's got to know that it cannot go up an incline more than so many degrees or come down something or go over a rock. So it's taking its time. It is a slow process. <clears throat> and it, what was it? I think Glen Elk is just 900 yards. I don't know why NASA keeps using, uh, well, again, this public affairs office. Uh, 900 yards, it just it hit me. So that's, well, you, you convert to that. Um, if you want to cheat, oh, it's almost 900 meters, right? 10% difference there. So, um, and it's taking 30 days to go there. So you can work out. And that's about the speed that they'll use going from Glen Elg up here down to the base of Mount Sharp where they're looking to aim. I imagine it's slower once it starts crossing. Whatever. Oh, yeah, it'll, um, it should be able to go uh, a bit faster, as I understand. They will go a little faster from Glenelg to Mount Sharp than the first 30 days, because it's testing it out, seeing how it works. You saw Phil's hand was a little jittery with that device going up and down. You've got to get the controls set for the computer to get it working properly. On one of the reports on NPR, I believe they said, Second. Okay. I believe that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so it's going, slow. It's going miles per hour on <laughs> What's the what's the power of longevity of this craft? Oh, uh, the RTG can last two years. <clears throat> uh, you're welcome to follow along marsjpl.nasa.gov/msl. They also Twitter. And, you know, they make it like the, the rover is actually talking to you on Twitter. Um, for the younger ones, you may want to be a Martian, not jpl.nasa.gov.
go, have a little fun about going over Mars and the like. And then, of course, the main uh, NASA.gov slash MS.